Oh, yes, sir. Stay right there. Come on. Stay right there. I'll be right back. Hey, welcome everybody to Talking Donkey International and our new television series, Country Wisdom. Let's set the tone for this new series of ours. It's found in Proverbs 4. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and then all your ways will be sure. Join us now for Country Wisdom. Janice, this is exciting because we're here in Railroad Park in Dunsmere, and this was your caboose at one time. Yes, it was, number 777. There's a long story here. I'll try to cut it down for you, but my father loved trains. He worked for the railroad for Southern Pacific right here in Dunsmere when he and my mother were first married. And in fact, he was a fireman on the Southern Pacific Division running the Shasta line. Now, only a little after a year, I think, the war hit. Pearl Harbor was attacked. My dad was gone for the next three years, but he never lost his love of trains. Every year when I was a kid, we would vacation up here in Dunsmuir, and we would walk the railroad tracks and search for trains, and I just loved this area. Now he died when I was only in high school, but he would get such a kick out of the fact that I live nearby now, that I'm up in this area. And a little while ago, my brother called me. Now my brother doesn't call very often, but he had a reason and it had to do with this caboose. You see, when I was about three or four years old, I got probably the best playhouse in the history of little girls and playhouses because my dad bought that caboose. That was your caboose that then? That was bought. my playhouse. Wow, hey, can we go inside and check it out? We can. Let, let's do it. Man, I'm glad to get in out of the rain here. <laughs> wow. wow, so this was your playhouse. This brings back memories, good memories. You have no idea how many hours I spent in this caboose as a child. It looked a little bit different. I assume there wasn't a big there queen bed. There was not a queen bed in the middle. <laughs> because in fact, what, Railroad Park uses this as a, a rental now for... Yes, it does. People yeah. can come and spend the night in a genuine caboose. Tell me what it was when there you were There used to be a couple of bunks that folded up against the wall right there that would come down. And back in the days when this really ran on the Shasta division, crew members would take their breaks. They could uh, sleep during when they weren't on shift. And there was a little pot-bellied stove. I mean, a beautiful little iron pot-bellied stove that was over in that corner. And up those steps, they're really narrow. There was storage. And you can see how it goes up. Yep. I used to love getting up, sitting on the benches up there, looking out the windows. Because when you're three or four, or six or seven or eight, being up there felt like I was in my own world. Well, you were. I could read, <laughs> I could look out the window and just daydream. It was a wonderful spot to just look out at life. Now this thing is as big as somebody's apartments today, you know, so you're a three-year-old girl, you had it all to yourself. <laughs> well, I had to share it with my brother and sister. Oh, was that a bad deal? Uh, <laughs> you see, I liked having tea parties, playing with my stuffed animals, and then my brother with John would come and say, all right, Janice, back in the house, my friends and I are taking over, and it would turn into a fort. They would play games where they were sometimes soldiers, sometimes they were cavalry. Uh, this caboose has had more lives inside, more imagination. Uh, 
it was just a wonderful place to grow up. Now I may put you on the spot, but mm -hmm. uh, what was the caboose for in the first place on the railroad? <laughs> Actually, it served a, a really good function. You know that when you talk about somebody being a caboose, they're the rear end. This was the last car in a train. And that cupola, that area up above, yep. crewmen would sit up there because from that vantage point, they could look down either side of the train. They were watching for things like sparks from the wheels, any issues going on they could keep watch from there. A lot of trains used to start fires on the tracks. <laughs> they did indeed. In fact, I told you my dad was a fireman. Uh, I honestly don't know if they still have that position on a train. Probably not. But that was his job, and he spent a lot of time in this caboose, because this caboose ran on the Shasta Division the same years that my dad worked there. So and he knows he had to have been in this. And number 777, that, yes. that's pretty interesting yes. too. Now you might have noticed, when we go back outside, I'll refresh your memory. Right now it's bright yellow and it says Erie Lackawanna, but in her heart she is still Southern Pacific. So they changed the label. They did. Here at uh, the Dunsmuir Railroad, Railroad Park, they had several Southern Pacific cabooses already. You saw some of them as we drove in. So they spiffed her up and turned her into something else because they didn't have an eerie Lackawanna caboose. How does it make you feel being, how many, well, no, I can't ask that of a lady, I guess. How many years <laughs> has it been? But forget I asked that, but um, how does it make you feel being back in your? It's bittersweet. Uh, because as I said, it brings so many memories back. I can remember running up and down those stairs, climbing up into the benches. Uh, out that door in the front was my house, and out this door in the back was my grandmother's house. Just about ideal. But and your on the daddy. other hand, it makes me realize that um, we've both gotten a little older. Not you, I mean the caboose and Thank me. you, thank you. <laughs> your daddy bought this for you. He bought it for, well, as I said, I had to share yeah, with my sure. brother and sister, but I felt like it was mine. So you had a father uh, that uh, really, really loved you. Yes, he did. And did I tell you why he was able to buy it? No. You'll see the cupola up there. You climb up to get that bird's eye view. Southern Pacific was scrapping all of these trains that had cupolas. And they were going to a brand new model that had bay windows on each side. Well, you could sit on so the you side could sit on and look the out. Side and look out. Okay. So they were getting rid of these. And my dad found out somehow. By that point, he was working as a dentist in Lodi, California. He found out. He tracked down the number, knew he'd been in this caboose in his railroad days, bought it, got it shipped to our house. The day they brought it in our backyard, they had to close the whole street, shut down traffic, everything. It was like pretty a parade. Because it's pretty good size. They hauled this thing on a flatbed, I think it was, and brought it into our backyard. He had a foundation ready for it, and he wired it so it had its lights, everything worked, and uh, it was the hit of the neighborhood, let me tell you. We also made the front page of the paper. I, can I have imagine. a picture I can show you of me with my brother and my sister on the end of the caboose out here. Took a picture and we were on the front page. I can imagine. That's as good as it gets when you're four years old. <laughs> now, I'm sure since you, you, look, we're here how many years in this area? Were you here in this area or are you? I was born in Lodi. Train came from here. It was born here, yes. but you were in Lodi. Right. Did, were you ever in this area though? Did you um, ever play we in the hills in, around here? Yes. Every year we vacationed in Dunsmuir. Okay. My dad would bring us up. There's an area called Cantera Loop and the train comes down one side of the river, makes a loop over a bridge, comes on the other side. And at that point, the engineer and the guys in the caboose could wave to each other across the river. Wow. And we used to come, and one of the things we would do every August, we would walk that stretch of track and uh, walk Cantera Loop. Um, it was quite the, quite the walk. I was a good hiker back then. Uh, 
But yes, my dad loved this area. I told you, well, he would love it knowing I live up in this area now. It's got some amazing views and vistas around here. Oh, it does. You, you want to head back out? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Need to fly fish out there. Well, Steve does. You know, he'll be out here just right there. He knows every hole. Man, I love the sound of that river, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I think that's half the fun of camping is being next to a river or a stream and just having that sound. And I'm so happy. The sun is shining, the rain quit. Oh, yes. Well, you know, that's what they say about this area. If you don't like the weather, just wait 10 minutes. That's Maybe true. Maybe 15. So you used to play oh, in all yeah. these areas. I've walked on trails all over here, um, all in this area. My dad loved this area. I told you that. In fact, when he and mom first got married and they moved here so he could work for the railroad, I think he would have stayed and uh, I would have grown up here. But the war had other plans. So he went into the military? Yes, he did. And uh, he was gone. He and mom had been married maybe a year. And then he was off to India, of all places. That's where he spent uh, the war years. Did you say India? India, yes. India. <laughs> when I was growing up, and in the summer when it would be hot, like pavement melting under your feet, I can remember running from my house across the street to my friend's house, barefoot, and you were actually leaving little prints in the pavement because it was that hot. But my dad, you could not ever say that it was hot because he would tell you you didn't know what heat was. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the reasons that I love it up here too, one of the reasons that he vacationed up here every year, uh, Part of his heart was here because I think it had been peaceful here. And certainly when we came up on vacation, you just feel like when you're out next to the river, when you're walking through these mountains, it just kind of, the weight rolls off. And I don't know what your childhood was like. Well, actually I do, so you can relate. But there was an awful lot of tension in the house I grew up in. But when we would come up here, to the mountains for every year, every August. We left that behind. Coming up here was truly a mental vacation. And I think that's why I still love it. Why we get out of the car at a trailhead and I hear the river and I just smile. Just the, the tension melts yes, away. Yes, yeah. because those were happy memories, consistently happy memories. Uh, well, I mean, so you really, you had a can I say a terrible childhood? Is that? I know you may hate to I say that. I know a lot of people might say terrible. Uh, for me, it was normal. I, it wasn't until you begin to compare other families. You know, you get older, you start spending time in other people's houses and realize, okay, in other families, they're not always angry. Uh, my friends' mothers didn't disappear into their bedrooms for days at a time and not come out. Really, that's what happened in your Yes, eyes. we had nannies before it was fashionable to have nannies uh, because there were just long periods where my mother simply didn't cope. Um, she relied on prescription drugs to get her through life and they didn't always work. Uh, and there were times, it was like a Jekyll and Hyde. I can remember walking home from school and as I would round a corner where I could see my house, my stomach would tighten up because I didn't know which mother was going to say hello. Wow. But up here, it was completely different. Everybody was happy. The whole family was happy when we would come and camp up here. Now, you also have to remember that my dad's idea of camping was a little bit <laughs> different. You might think, oh, we put up tents right next to the stream. No, we were staying in a little lodge. My dad oh, felt that like, was camping. yeah, camping was anything less than a Best Western motel. 
Okay. Uh, but it had a little kitchenette, and I remember the deck that looked out over the river. Uh, so for him, that was camping. He, he was not into roughing it too much. Can I ask you, and this is, you know, kind of the mindset of you've got this little girl with her great playhouse that daddy bought her, and so she's got some really fond memories there, but you've also got this other side of life that, that wasn't, wasn't good. Now, where does it go? I mean, do you, do you carry that into adulthood or God have something else in mind? God always has something else in mind. <laughs> God takes whatever twisted little mess your life is and starts helping you unravel it. Uh, I, I gotta stop you, that is what? such a great analogy. Twisted little mess, you know, yeah. a twisted little mess. Mm -hmm. I, I can almost picture that, you know, and <laughs> helps you unravel it. Yes. How did he yes. do that for you? First of all, you know, in scripture, God promises us a peace that we can't even understand. And it's because he knew our little human brains, there's no reason to explain how you can have something chaotic going on around you, whether it's something from the outside, uh, world events, uh, family falling apart, a marriage falling apart, but God still gives you that peace that only comes from Him. It's not something you can manufacture. This for you, it even started as a child, apparently. You know, growing up, both my grandmothers lived in town, and every weekend, my father's mother would come by in her bright red VW that she drove very fast. She had a nickname, she was Hot Rod Letcher. And back then before, oh, did we even have seatbelt laws? No, we didn't. No. Uh, and back then it was, well, how many of the kids can cram into grandma's VW and go to church? And my mother's mother lived right next door. We had a huge backyard. My dad owned three city lots on the corner. So our house and a big front yard were one city lot. Our garage and carport and driveway were another full city lot. You could park like nine or 10 cars in our driveway. And then on this side, we had a huge backyard. That's where the caboose was and a gate that went to grandma's house. I always had that escape. If things got too bad, I just went to grandma's house. Do not underestimate the effect of grandparents in kids' lives. Uh, whether they're your genetic grandparent or an adopted grandparent. Uh, but I could always go there. And my grandmothers, um, my grandma Letcher would go over there and she would just pound on the piano. I learned all the old hymns from her. She only had one. She didn't know things like pianissimo or everything was forte when she played the piano. But I still remember all of her favorite hymns and there are times when those lyrics will come to mind. Uh, if you want to learn scripture, put them to music. What was a favorite? Do you have a favorite that pops in? <laughs> Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Yeah, yeah. I can still hear her playing and singing Blessed Assurance. You know, it's exciting because we all have that Blessed Assurance through Jesus Christ. Yes, and I think that when you are out in a spot like this, I mean, look around you, Jim, the trees, the little breeze, uh, again, back to the sound of that river, you can just breathe out here. Uh, you feel closer to God out here than anywhere else, I think. Mm -hmm. Nature uh, is God's second book. It right? sure is. Now, not too far up this trail. I promised you it wasn't too far. We're going to come to some railroad tracks and I'll get back to the story of my caboose. I get the rest of the story. Yes. Huh? All right. Just like Paul Harvey, there's there. the rest of the story. There you go. I wrote a little book a while back called Overcoming the Three Ds. Depression, discouragement, despair. It's helped thousands of people. If you'd like a copy, you can log on to TalkingDonkeyInternational.org and for a small gift, it can be yours. Please do it today. So these tracks are where that caboose I showed you started out its life. 
All right. And of course, it was built to run the railroads. And then when it had outlived its usefulness, they were going to scrap it. And you would have thought, that's it. That's what else does a caboose do? Then my dad bought it and it became our playhouse. So it had this second life, but it wasn't done yet. However, I think I'm hearing a train. I think I'll step at least outside the track. <laughs> Maybe we should. I love that sound, almost as much as the sound of the river that we heard coming up here, yeah. Yeah. because it reminds me of those days. I used to walk these tracks for miles, trying not to fall off. Do not ask me to attempt it now. Well, I know you're but, gonna try. But, <laughs> but that caboose had this second life as my playhouse. Then after I grew up and left home, Again, you would think, well, that was it. It was lucky enough to have that second life that nobody could have pictured, but it wasn't done. My mother sold it to a woman who ran a freight barge up and down the Delta. She put it on her barge and it became her office and a spot for the guys who worked for her to take really? naps, to sleep when they were you know, not on their shift. And so it went up and down the Delta River for years. Then, again, you'd think, okay, now that surely is it. That caboose now has had three lives, but no, fourth life. It's back here where it started, on the Shasta Division, and now it's a bed and breakfast. So every time you would think, well, there's nothing more I can do, nothing more that this caboose is useful for. There's another life. There's another there's life, another something life. you yeah. couldn't have even pictured ahead of time which I just think is great. Now I wonder, as the train's coming here, does it ever kind of get those feelings, you know, in your heart and your mind? Or, or? I do, because there have been periods where I've kind of thought, like, that's it. You know, when my kids grew up and left home, briefly, two of them came back. But you think, that's it. Let's head up here so we can watch Let's the train. Let's do that. long trains today. Oh, much longer than they used to be. And they used to put helper engines into the center of the train. But you notice what it doesn't have. It doesn't have a caboose. No caboose anymore. But my caboose, my playhouse, had multiple lives that you just couldn't have predicted. And as I was starting to tell you, when my kids left home, I had this feeling like, well, that's it. I, I was a mom for so long. What do I do now? So I can kind of relate to that caboose because I'm reaching or have reached a certain age. And maybe it's just women who start to feel this way, or I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I doubt it. I wouldn't Where, tell you if I did. You know? No, no, you're, you're far too smart to say you've noticed I've aged. But you kind of start to feel like, well, I guess that's the end of my usefulness because really, you know, what more is there that I could do? Uh, it's got to be younger people or more talented people or whatever. But just like that caboose, you know, had reached the end of its usefulness. But it really hadn't, right? No. That's what's so cool about, about God. And you found the Lord. And it's just like in the Bible, God always lays out something. And one of the things he laid out is the story of Moses. Moses, you might remember, he was in the, the Pharaoh's court. The guy really high up, he had everything for 40 years, I mean, he was on a roll. And then all of a sudden, he murdered somebody, kicked out of the kingdom, flees for his life, spends 40 years in the desert as a, a shepherd, herded sheep, that was it. 
Never imagined that phase of his life. No, but he began enjoying life. You know, it was kind of kicked back now and, and enjoying life. One day, all of a sudden, he sees a burning bush. He approaches that burning bush, and it's got a, a voice that comes out and says, Hey, Moses, <laughs> you know, Moses, I've got a job for you. And he goes, Whoa, what kind of job for me? God is in that burning bush, basically. He begins talking with Moses and I've got another job for you, Moses. Moses is 80 years old. <laughs> got a new job for you. I want you to lead an entire nation out of bondage. You know, what would we do? Well, he followed God, and it was such an amazing story for another 40 years he led. There's, there's always something exciting when you follow God. I, I even think about uh, Colonel Sanders. I think he started <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken in his 70s. You know, became a, who knows, a multi-multi-millionaire in his 70s. God has so many pathways for us, you know, and, and I, that's what I think about in your own life. I look at what happened in your life and what God has done. Oh, there are things that I've been able to do that I never could have pictured. Uh, couldn't have picked, imagined that I had the ability to do those things, go on mission trips with you, strap on a tool belt and help build a church or a school. Um, mentoring someone younger. I have a friend, a young mother, and we've just found that we get together and I realize that I'm a stabilizing force, I'm an inspiration, uh, not because I'm so wonderful, but just I make time for her. Think about that, a stabilizing force from where you started <laughs> right. from. Nobody would have thought I could stabilize anyone. And then here in the last few years, if you had told me a decade ago that I would be asked to come and speak at uh, women's weekends, if, if that I would be asked to talk to different church congregations, I couldn't have pictured myself as there's someone who wants to hear what I have to say. That, those are doors that God opened because I wasn't looking for those doors. But just like my playhouse uh, that had multiple lives, every time I've been about to think, well, that's probably it. You know, that was great. I'm glad I could do that, but I can't think of anything else that I'm good for or would be useful for. God opens another door. You know, God changed Janice's life. He can change yours as well. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost your job. Everything in life, it seems like it's falling apart, but not so with God. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Scripture says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. That's right now. God has an amazing array of things prepared for you. Draw near to God, trust him, and he will certainly draw near to you. Hey, thanks for joining us for Country Wisdom. See you next time. 